What is going on? What is going on? What is going on, party people? It is your boy, Coach D. Brown, former big legal, former first round pick with the Kansas City Royals. And man, we are, I mean, sometimes we just got to do it big sometimes, man. And uh, I mean, not to say that we don't do it big on a, on a daily basis, but man, this is uh, one of those special, special times, man. We got, uh, we join me, I, you know, it's always great when we have, you know, big time conferences and big time schools, man. But um, I've heard great things about the the head coach we're going to speak with today. Um, heard about great stuff about his staff. Um, I know they're doing big things over there. I'm, you know, me personally, I've I've drove through the city of Knoxville many of times, but I've I've known a lot of major leaguers that played at Tennessee who going on to brought homes and stuff and lived there full time in Knoxville. So let us me know that it's a beautiful, beautiful place. I've just kind of drove through and it looks good outside looking in, man. But Man, without further ado, man, we got, you know, Tony Vitello, head coach of the Tennessee Volunteers, man, University of UT, all right, Knoxville, all right? So, coach, man, appreciate you joining us today, man. How you doing, bro? Thanks, D. Doing well. Big time is a very relative term. I don't I don't know that we're anywhere near that, but it is a big time town and a, and a big time university with a huge fan base. So, uh, one thing we're trying to do is bring all those fans back that some of those former big leaguers that have played here, like Todd Helton and Ho Chaver and several others, um, you, you know, the, how they had it rolling in the past. I mean, the Vol fans were just as on board with baseball as they were with Pat Summit's Lady Hoops and Coach Fulmer's football team. And, you know, there was a little bit of a, a lull there and not just our sport here, but a few others. And now the timing seems to be incredible. As long as you throw that virus thing out uh, the window, um, the, the building up of some of these programs has been exciting to watch. Yeah, I mean – Tennessee is one of those programs that across the board, you know, um, always been known for having strong sports. I mean, obviously, like you said, with Pat Summit and um, the powerhouse, you know, it's sad, it's sad to say that if you're for girls, you know, they're like 20, I say maybe 15 to 21 and younger. They don't really remember how much of a powerhouse Tennessee was at basketball. They were the UConn before UConn. And, I don't even want to pump another school over there. But, I mean, I, again, I, I saw that in the top 25. And, you know, back in the day, I used to be a real uh, Shamika Holskoff fan. And she was a yeah. New York girl. And uh, she was she was all everything, man. And I was a big ball fan. And I forgot about Hoshe. But, yeah, Hoshe was one of my teammates. I'm, I'm forgetting about him. And I think I think Joe Nathan, I think Hoshe, I think Ty Helton, I think uh, even some minor league guys, I don't think they really truly made it. But they used to, you know, play at Tennessee and they – used to just rave about, you know, uh, Tennessee, man. And uh, like I said, man, be, being in Memphis on the other side of the state and, and living there many, many years, a lot of volunteer fans. And, uh, man, you get to appreciate the, like you said, that fan base is crazy and rabid. Um, but, man, let's uh, – I want to know about more about Coach Vitello, man. I want to learn about the man behind, you know, this program that's being – you know, that he's turning around over here, man. So, uh, Coach V, man, I'm going to give you my own nickname for you, man. We're going to uh, – I want to learn more about you, man. So let's go back to the, you know, where you're from, your playing career to, you know, where you where you are now as the head coach of University of Tennessee. Yeah, no, I'm from St. Louis and I grew up in the Ferguson Florissant district. And uh, uh, my father's from Chicago and, and he's kind of who I looked up to and learned a lot from because he was a coach. He also I mentioned he's from Chicago, was a Cubs fan. So I had I had to learn how to argue and even fight physically every now and then being a Cubs fan in the middle of St. Louis was not exactly the best recipe, <laughs> um, but kind of baseball gospel right there, you know, being able to go to Wrigley field and uh, listening to Harry Carey sometimes makes sense. Other times not make sense. So she bought a seventh inning, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. You said it. So, um, you know, all those things kind of led me down the baseball path um, but in particular, I, I kind of was into whatever athletic season it was at the time and messed around with a couple other sports in high school. But baseball was the one that was going to get me the furthest. And um, I had to scratch and claw to do some things. I was always playing around the best players, um, but I wasn't, you know, by any means one of the best players. So um, fortunately, in a roundabout way, I ended up going to University of Missouri as a walk on. And that was not a, hey, we think you can help us, but we're not going to be able to give you money. It was, we know your dad has good players at the high school, so we're going to be nice to you. <laughs> um, but it worked out. Um, was able to kind of survive each day. 
and ended up becoming a guy who was literally throwing batting practice, pregame batting practice as a senior to our players. So that kind of opened up the door of, well, can I help next year, you know, and just hit a fungo and throw BP? And we really didn't have a lineage of having a volunteer coach at, at Missouri at the time. And wow. um, so it was a unique deal. I got to coach guys that I played with the year before. And uh, one of those guys was Ian Kinsler. So I didn't really need to coach him. Uh, he made the rest of us look good. And then one of the guys I just was very fortunate enough to be around that I think has molded me as, as much as some of these other guys I may mention is Jace Tingler, who's now the coach of the Padres. Um, and, you know, had to uh, try to give Fernando Tatis a 3-0 green light or uh, red light mm -hmm. last night, but Tatis hit one out anyway. But that's a whole nother. Talk about stuff like that. Yeah, I love it. Yeah, we're talking about it. We're going to hit that up in a little bit, man. Yeah. That's been a, the talk of the the worms thing, right there. <laughs> That was a man right there that hit that. I I was like, oh, I understand the unwritten rules, but you hit something like that on that pitch and hit it like that. Right. Mm. And that was not a that wasn't a bad pitch either. And, no. You know, no. My, my thing is I I'm not big into old, you know, old school. You got to put your head down and run. And, you know, the bat flip thing, I'm not i I'm I'm just kind of in between. My my thing is as a competitor, if you don't want someone to celebrate on your home field or rub it in your face, then you better beat them. Otherwise, mm. And, mm. and I've had to eat crow on that many a times, but it's right. kind of the rules of the game. Amen. And uh, listen, I, when I first saw it, I was like, I know I wouldn't want it done, but then I don't know. I, like I was, I guess I was still the traditionalist in me and I'm usually not that guy. I was like, I right, seven, nothing, whatever. And Woody, the manager, that's my boy. You know, I go back with Woody a long time, yeah. man. And uh, so <laughs> when I saw what he hit and how he hit it, I was like, well, Hey, he, he didn't get cheated, and, he, and it wasn't no cheapy. It was a line drive, oppo bomb like that on a good pitch, like you said. Right. And I'm like, hey, hey, I'm going to give it to him. Go ahead. I, I, you know, he didn't yeah. get cheated on that, man. You know, this isn't Albert Pools who's already got his name in the record books. This is a young right. guy that's hungry. Right. And Jace has those guys kind of playing almost like a college team. And mm. also, what if he loses the home run race by one home run? you know, or wins it by one in this case because he hit that one out. So and, and you and I both know, you know, behind the scenes, you know how to go. Numbers is everything. He could he take the flag and say, I'm sorry over there, but that bomb and three RBIs at the end of the year is going to mean I mean four RBI, I'm sorry, four RB, four yeah. baby, you know what I'm saying? It's gonna mean a whole lot when it comes to getting paid. So, you know, ain't no different from somebody over there getting some garbage points in the NBA or taking a garbage sack on NFL. You know what I mean? When you know you're gonna get paid on the end of that. You better got to take them ribbies, man, and, get, and hit that ball. Shoot, you know? And, and he is one of my top three or four most exciting players right now. Man, gosh, his skill set is ridiculous. I mean, I heard a lot about him, but just watching him and, you know, it's big boy, man, athletic, you know, a lot different from his dad. You you remember, his dad, you know, you probably oh, yeah. were a St. Louis fan watching his dad over there, you know? so Yeah, no, it's, it's guys like that that keep it fresh. And, you know, people always question our game's been around as long as anybody's and people want to say, well, it's dying or it's too slow or what kids like that are going to keep people interested and, and keep refreshing uh, the characters we have in the game. So uh, kudos to guys that can perform like that. There's no reason to shoot holes in how they're doing it. I, I, I agree with you, man. And, and listen, man, speaking of style of play and um, I, I, I'm anxious to hear, man. I I, I look at your current roster and I, I look. I saw you. I saw you guys play Vandy. Was it last year? Um, and like I said, I, I was I was hearing things, and I talked. Like I said, I talked to Ross in the background uh, a couple of summers ago, and he's still mad at me. Tell him, tell him, don't be so mad at me no more, man. He, he I, I, I've been on his. Uh, you know, I, I pulled out of a tournament of his, man, uh, a couple years ago. Yeah, I got you. He, he got, he has not let me let it down since then. You know what I'm saying? So yeah. to tell him, tell him I'm sorry, man. I don't know what else I got to do, man. He don't even set my clothes no more, anything, man. So <laughs> tell him I'm sorry. Lord have mercy. But anyway, uh, <laughs> but I was watching you guys, and I said, uh, I was like, man, you got some athletes out there, man. And, you know, I'm be choopy told, you know what I mean? I'm like, you got some brothers out there that can play too, man. Yeah. So, you know, I, 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 I'm excited to hear um, – you know, because you're, you're one of the few big time power five schools that loves to put brothers out there. You know, some athletes out there. You look like it, to me outside looking in, it's like, yo, 
if he's athletic and play a little bit, I want him. You know what I'm saying? I ain't trying to be listening. But I coach him up and all of that. Have you always been like that? Because I know you come from some big time programs, you know, um, has that always been your model or what? A little bit that stems from my dad and kind of goes back to the high school days. I went to a private high school that was predominantly white kids. And, and my dad was a teacher and kind of a, a domineering figure in the hallways. And he he. He's never been in those guys' shoes, but he knows it can't be easy. So mm. by no means was he the patriarch, but he knew those guys needed to be looked after a little bit. And part of that, you know, I'm jumping way ahead. But now my thing is here, um, all these kids, especially nowadays, come from different backgrounds. And if you're not willing to kind of flex and bend a little bit, um, you know, you're, you're probably going to become a dinosaur because there are not many more, you know, Bob Knights or dictators in these positions. And so, you know, a little bit of it stems from that high school experience. And then, like I said, that's my fly. I don't care. We're fortunate enough to have a Puerto Rican kid on our team. It doesn't matter. All these guys need to be given a fair chance. And sometimes a fair chance for me and a fair chance for you are different because we came up in different backgrounds and we're mm. given different opportunities. Mm. Um, so, that, so that's big for me. And then, yeah, ultimately, when we are looking out for guys, we want, you know, to give guys a chance. And, and um, you, you know, we want to recruit athletic kids. And then the other thing is, too, um, I, I like guys that have personality. And it, it doesn't matter who you are, where you come from. But in this game, if you don't bring some personality to the table because you're comfortable in your own skin, you're going to be a pretender. I mean, mm -hmm. Todd mm -hmm. is comfortable in his own skin. And maybe it's because of his daddy or maybe because he's got the good hair, uh, or just because he can hit, but he's very comfortable in his own skin, just like many of the other best baseball players. And that's what we either try and recruit or pull out of our guys here. Uh, yeah, I mean, and I, like I said, uh, I mean, for those, you know, listen, I, I got a wide range of uh, guests. I mean, well, you know, people that listen in and will continue to listen in to this, man. And, uh, you know, we hear our stories, you know, we hear the stories of the Power Five and not really recruiting the black kids and this and that. But I looked at your roster, I think it was last year. Uh, and I know you had it a few more, but I was just like, damn, he look, you know, he looked like he, you know, he giving these kids some real opportunities, man. So speaking of recruiting, I don't want to just talk about a black and white thing, but, but I mean, Tennessee is in the SEC. you in, you know, the top conference, if not, the, you know, the one, you know, one of the top two or three. I, I know you're going to say number one, and rightfully so, but, <laughs> you know, you got to come compete and, and all of that, man. So um, you've been in the SEC for a while now, but having your own program now, where, where when it comes to recruiting, are you just like, you know, do you feel like, hey, he's a smorgasbord? I, I, I'm in the SEC. I got to get the best talent. I don't care where you're from or what. Yeah, no, it was chaos when we first got the job. So, and, and none of us had roots here before. Um, it turned out I knew not one major person here, but a few people that all kind of helped. Usually you get a job when you have a connection. I didn't really have much of a connection here, but there was enough small ones that it kind of worked out. Uh, but none of us are from this part of the country. And so it was a scramble. It turned into Wisconsin, Albuquerque, Southern California, Florida, New Jersey. It didn't matter. Mm -hmm. um, but now things have settled in a little bit more regionalized and we've kind of come up with, okay, how is it going to work here? What are our strengths? And I know you said you wanted to move on from the previous topic, but you know, the diversity thing is, uh, something that I've worked at four different schools now and it's mind boggling to me and really it's kind of astounding that every university in the state doesn't have something they can offer, you know, Puerto Rican kid, Native American kid, African American kid, and it's different. Well, in baseball, if you have those things, you're going to maybe seek that out more. For us, we don't have a lot of financial help in some areas, so we got to be really sure about how we're spending our money. Um, we do have an in-state lottery like a lot of the SEC schools, uh, but if you were to throw our wallet out on the table compared to some of the others in our league, um, it, it's not nearly as big. There's some we're better off than too. I, I'll admit that. Um, mm -hmm. If not, some of those other SEC coaches will be calling in. But um, you know, it, it is a lot more like Major League Baseball than people think with the budgets. Everyone here is 11.7, 11.7. First of all, every school costs a different amount. So right mm -hmm. off the bat, we're not equal. Mm -hmm. um, we'll have different types of help and things like that. So. I think it's really key to get to know the place you're at and go with what works best for you at that particular place. 
So that's been a work in progress. And now we feel a lot more comfortable uh, about that, you know, what we got going on here. Yeah. And that's why I said, like, uh, I'm glad you want to keep talking about it. Usually it's an uncomfortable guy, you know, but even HBCU coaches want to kind of jump off that topic a little bit fast, man. But uh, like I said, that's that was that was the when I looked at your roster. And again, it wasn't I, don't, I wasn't looking. I, I, I was just I was looking from a. Um, I think it was right around the time I was supposed to come over to the campus and with my boys and I was just like, let me just kind of see what they got. And then I was just like, wow, I was like, okay. You know, and I, and I've heard, I forgot who told me this. Um, and, and shout out to my boy, Kevin, uh, my boy, Kevin, oh my God, Ken, K Moore is going to kill me. Kendrick Moore, Arkansas alum. All right. What's up, yeah. K Moore? You out here? Um, he posts, he says, he posts, posts talking to another, uh, follower of mine in Texas says by, Jim, by far, was the best recruiter I followed in Arkansas's history. He did a great job at Arkansas. Hope he has a huge success at Tennessee when he is not competing against the Hogs. All right. <laughs> so, <laughs> but but K Moore is a former teammate of mine and obviously an Arkansas alum. And um I've heard this about you before uh I I you know I I, I don't know who told me, you know, you kind of just hear things and they're like you know, dude, this, this dude is a hell of a recruiter. You know what I'm saying? He's going to get the best talent. Um, Tennessee got a good one. I think it was your first year coming over. And somebody, I don't, you know how it is in the baseball world. Somebody was just talking, and uh, I didn't know much, you know what I'm saying, about you. But they were like, you know, the dude can recruit his butt off. And I just I just happened to see this post from my boy, K. Moore. Um, so, um, like I said, I, I being being at the SEC, being at the ball, balls, and I like what, you, what the balls, and you have different price points and all of that, stating that um bringing in the talent that you bring in competing now at the highest level um do you feel like man you know i'm 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 blessed i got a hell of a coaching staff man there's nothing to do but go up from here and and like take it back to where you you know the balls used to be you know guys like myself in the the 90s and stuff with the heltons and those boys bombing away man do you guys feel like you're that close or what well i think for baseball um guys that are playing out there regardless of age including the big leaguers i mean i've been able to be around scherzer it, you never have it figured out ever, ever. You might even win the Cy Young. You still don't have it figured out what the best conditioning is on that particular day or what pitches the throw. There's always a way in this game that you can get better. And, um, you know, for program, I think we're at a point where it's like that. We're, we're so far from having it figured out, mm-hmm. but you got to have some sort of vision. And I think we all envy a place uh, kind of like a couple football programs have done in college football where they've gotten so good, it's about how can I uphold this standard as opposed to making that climb. So mm-hmm. right now we're in the midst of a climb, and uh, we certainly can't get too confident about what we're doing. It, it's great that fans are uh, you know applauding that we've made some progress, but we get too caught up in that. We're going to get steamrolled in this league. So for now, we just need to keep on the incline and then hope to get to a point where – uh, admittedly, a place like Arkansas, where I was fortunate enough to work, is you know you want to uphold that standard, and you kind of dislike that fan that that complains the one year you don't make it to Omaha, but you really like that you got fans that expect to go to Omaha. It's a little bit of a catch twenty two. So um, you know, I like where we're at. We've made progress. A little bitter that last year got cut short because I think we we're about to do some special things. But yeah, had a, nice, a nice little record going on huh? when you're going in, yeah, yeah. you know, and, and we had some things going that we didn't have the previous years. We had some chemistry and some attitude and a first mm. rounder and we looked really physical in the uniform. Mm. But, you know, there's about 90 percent of the coaches in the country last year could have said, well, we we're about to win the conference basketball tournament or, you know, we don't know. So it's easy to talk about, but we'll just have mm. to pick up where we left off and. We're a long, long way away from saying we've done what, you know, such as there's been a couple coaches that have literally created a powerhouse out of nothing at, at some of these SEC schools. And I don't like them because we have to play them, but I sure as heck respect them. And we're, we're trying to do something similar here. Mm. I uh, Let me just get a few guys, Lou, and we're going to get some of these questions in. Uh, yeah. I, I, I let it, one come right here. Uh, hey, Coach, how is Cam from Henderson High School doing with y'all? Yeah, you know, Nashville's pot cam's doing well. He's improved. And, and um, you know, the one thing that's crazy about Nashville is that population is 
I mean, you've seen that they've got, instead of having a city skyline, they've got t-shirts made of just skyscrapers. Right. And what's great for all the programs in the state of Tennessee, middle, East Tennessee state, Vanderbilt, Tennessee, and others is that population rise is improving the, the brand of baseball over in Nashville. And heck, we've got Nixon Zell and other guys that have come from this area, Trammell and Helton, but the, the population increase in Nashville is making Tennessee an even better state in baseball. And it's, it's kind of good timing for us. You know, doubt about it. I can, you know, me being out there myself, I mean, I, I mean, Nashville's always been talented and all, all shout out to all my people out there in Memphis and, um, you know, some good, some good ball players, man. And they're getting, you know, getting better. And, you know, the main thing is, uh, from a mindset wise, I see a little change going from the type of ball player that's being, you know, I don't know much Tennessee baseball before I got there, but I mean, yeah, they're doing their thing, man. And yeah, Nashville is growing like, like crazy, you know what I'm saying? And, yeah. uh, good city though. Um, and, and Memphis, gonna- Memphis is too. It's just, you know, it's crazy, the shape of our state. It's a good ways away, but we have so many fans there. So um, I was bitter to hear you first bring that that up because it reminded me in the fall, we were supposed to go and play at Millington so that we could kind of bring our team to some of those fans that maybe don't have the time or resources to come up and see us. Mm. Uh, but I don't think we'll be able to travel during the fall off campus. So. Yeah, that would have been awesome. Yeah. And uh, speaking of Millington, Coach Eaton does, was doing camps there last year in Millington. He said, tell him to keep grinding. It's going to get big for the balls. And uh, he and uh, Coach Eaton runs a post-grad program down in uh, Florida. And uh, DJ said, what's up? What up, DJ? Uh, let me see here. You got a little – got to get these in. They always uh, – let me see. Hey, Coach Vitello. Uh, my son and I met you at the Banditos workout when he was 12, when you were at Arkansas, Jaden Hill, 2021, 61215, lefty lefty, Twitter at Jay Hill. Hey, Corey Hill, hey, plug him in over there. I hey, plug him in. Well, I remember, too. Corey's a good man, and uh, I certainly remember. Jaden was all about it. You would kill to go to a camp full of kids that kind of have the attitude of being about it. Some of them are kind of going through the mm. most those are valuable days, man. I'd, I'd kill to go back and be a young kid at a basketball or baseball camp. Mm. We were speaking about the camps, man, and I want to kind of give this question to you, man. Um, you know, uh, I posted something, and it's been a heavy conversation the last week or so. A um, couple of things. First, would you, being the hell of a recruiter that, you know, you are, right, Do you rather? would you rather a kid uh, – go to the world with bad and play in a tournament for that week or so. And, and you get to see him with the staff or would you rather that kid come and play uh, and do like a little showcase, you know, uh, more of an enclosed type of thing there on campus at your, you know, at, at in Knoxville and, you know, in front of you guys. Sure. Which one would you rather have? Well, I think with the, the, our recruiting rules are just out of date. I mean, we've got a lot of things out of, in our game, they're out of whack and, so we can't visit a lot of these kids that are not seniors. And if they come up and are at a camp, it's almost like a half visit, um, you know, half showcase. And then even a sprinkle in a little bit of the family gets to see how we interact with the kids. So there's a lot of value there um, with that particular school, you know, so it's almost kind of like a single shot. If you're looking for more of a scattergun approach, you know, the world would bat thing is obviously better because you have so many schools that are either watching with live stream this year or in normal times all there in person. So like anything, probably a good mix of both. Find two or three schools that you're you're very interested in specifically and maybe there's some mutual interest or maybe not. Maybe it's your dream school and hit those camps. But then, you know, you almost kind of have to do the PBR perfect game circuit nowadays to some extent. Five tool is another one that's a little bit more in the Midwest. But the other thing is, and I may have someone slash my tires somewhere along here. You got to draw the line as a parent on the finances because Mm. we don't have full scholarships. Mm. And to me, I don't think a parent should fear saying, Hey, we've done all this stuff all summer. We can't go to the tournament this weekend, or we're going to take, you know, or th- this camp. I know that's crazy because I like ball players that want to play anytime, anywhere. But th- this financial thing is so out of whack. It kind of ties into our other conversation is, you know, you're kind of looking at power fives. Well, our-, our game is prejudiced, not against color, but against finance. It's a white collar sport. 
And so you end up with certain rosters, um, you, you know, or demographics on your roster be, because of a reason. It's like take some money from MLB or, you, you know, or go to school and pay 25 grand to go to Tennessee or something like that. So mm -hmm. we could mm -hmm. get into that topic, but uh, just kind of throwing it out there. I, I think parents should realize they can't buy an SEC school into liking them. So they should be, you know, have a plan with the finances because it can get out of control. Hey, <laughs> I'm, I'm writing this stuff down, coach. All right. You know, you, you cannot buy an SEC kid, uh, team to like you, meaning you can pay all you want for perfect game and all these tournaments and all of that. And if they don't like it, they don't like you, man. So you, you better be strategic in your finances and your moves. And I like what he said. I like what you said, coach. Also, it's not necessarily a color thing. It's a finance thing, man. It, it, it has become a country club type thing, man, with these. That's why I, I, I don't know. I, 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 it, I don't know. It's, un, it's unfortunate. And, and uh, you know, there's, there's older, wiser guys that uh, kind of come to the forefront on some of these issues. But you know, moving back the schedule so that it's warmer. And there's a lot of things we could do to improve our game, adding a third coach, but I just don't see how fixing the scholarship issue isn't the first priority. Mm -hmm. in our mm -hmm. sport. And mm -hmm. before you would say, well, too bad, too sad. You're not football or basketball. Well, I don't know the exact numbers, but Omaha is going off every year. Yeah. Every season game is now on TV. Yeah. Um, there, there's a there's a lot of things that kind of point to the fact that it, it's it's it doesn't make sense. But yeah, I I, I saw some crazy number with the amount of the the, the views, um, with the college baseball as a whole as a sport, the amount of money and the revenue that has increased over the last three to five years. Um, I mean, truth be told, I mean, from a business standpoint, like look, doing this type of stuff. You know, I could, I ain't going to say very easily do the MLB, but I, I, you know, being in Memphis, being in SEC country, yeah. and I had to go back and remember the days of when I was in high school. You know what I'm saying? And like, hey, these kids really want to go to, because they were asking me these college, co you know, all these college questions. And I was just, you know, I've been in the pro game, for, you know, for, you know, in and around the game for over 15 years. And I was like, I'm like, I, I, don't, even, I don't even watch a college baseball game. I don't know. And I was dealing with youth baseball players. So, I had to revert back to the college game, but just do a little bit of research and homework. And I was just like, dad, like this college baseball stuff is really blowing up, you know, so with the SEC network and, and the World Series and the amount of programs and the amount of the facilities that you guys have. You know what I'm saying? Some of these programs is like, I was like, You're better than, you know, double A, triple A, you know, facilities, man, you know. And don't, don't say it too loud, but coaches' salaries, um, everything has gone up in, in our sport in dollar value. But the thing that's changed is scholarships have actually gone down. They used to be 13, and there's more better players now. I mean, kids in Wisconsin can play indoors all year long, like on baseball field. Wow, so there's yeah. better players, but fewer dollars. And also, we play fewer games than we used to, too, if you include the fall. So, really, um, I don't know. There's my soapbox. Maybe I'll be like 65 and important one day, and I can say this is what we should do. <laughs> hey, if you go out there, if you go out there and, and get a ring or two over there in, in Omaha, and, all, and then you be on that Skip Berman and all that, and you could kind of and and, and uh, what's what's my man name over there with uh, uh, Texas and uh, Cal State Fullerton, uh, Augie, yeah, you know, you know, they were like the, you know, the president and and, and of everything, whatever they said went, and when, at least I was looking hey. in, you know, hey. Uh, Two rings, and I might be on the coast of Italy all year long. So <laughs> you're, you're uh, more than welcome to join. I, hey, no doubt about it, man. Uh, Arby said, what's, what's up, man? I appreciate it, man. This is why I do what I do. All right. Uh, uh, let's see. Coach Eaton says, do they play? Do you play any HBCU schools, man? It, it, it varies. It's very difficult um, to schedule in general for every sport. I, I've been coaches with other um, – friends with other coaches, you do it so early in advance and you got to be careful with your money. It's like scholarship money. Um, so there's only so much money to dish out. And then at Arkansas was crazy. They couldn't play other in-state Arkansas schools till just recently. So we were wow. really limited. You had to go really far here at Tennessee, because we're technically in the East, we're surrounded by a bunch of schools. Mm -hmm. So go outside of our little two hour radius doesn't make a lot of sense and unless it's in you know sec play conference play mm, yeah i, I uh 
Ske scheduling is crazy. I mean, how, how far out do you? How far out do you do the scheduling? How, I know football. Sometimes those guys are like six, seven, eight years out. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, we're, but, we're on 2024 right now, and we've discussed some 2025 stuff with people. And there's, I guarantee, there's older, wiser coaches that are ahead of where we are. So it's mm. kind of like recruiting, and uh, and same thing budget wise. You know, even the the Power Five schools are limited. You can't just buy opponents like football can sometimes. So mm. there, there's a little bit of strategy to it. Yeah, and that's how I wonder. I was like, I mean, I know you want, you may want to go to that lesser name school just to bring your brand. You know what I'm saying to yeah. that particular small school. But then you got to worry about wins and losses. Right. And, and then you don't want all the smaller schools to come in there because then it looks like you, you know, you know, trying to cake up your, your scheduling over there. So I, I, I ain't gonna lie, like speaking to you college coaches, I know and I know every coach has a lot of responsibilities, man. But um, I love speaking to, you know, especially the bigger the programs, the D1, you know, because you guys are like <laughs> you seem like you do like 90 percent other stuff besides coach, you know, what I'm you got to be. Like, you know, you got to be a good CEO. I mean, right. I, I think right. I worked for, you know, Coach Van Horn was one of the, the best baseball coaches in the United States. But there's a lot of the stuff that I know he doesn't – he deals with it, but he doesn't like dealing with it that's more on the CEO side of things. And really to survive, you probably have to be pretty good or at least good enough at, at both areas. But you're right. It, I think pro ball guys get their – you know, kind of hair blown back a little bit when they see how much non-baseball stuff goes on for us. Uh, but it's nature of the game, and it's better than sitting in a cubicle with a suit, suit and tie on. You know, no, no, no doubt about it, man. Because listen, man, you, uh, it's like you, you're, you're at least a professional ball. You kind of, I mean, you have an AD and stuff like that. But you guys, it seems like the coaches, the coaches have to deal with the budgeting and the, the travel and. And, you know, and present it to the AD to, I guess, get the yes or the no's. I mean, that's what it looks like for me. But when the pro guys is just you're just answering up, you know what I'm saying? And you're not necessarily dealing with the, the budgeting and the money. And, you know, you guys got to divvy up the scholarships. You got to, you know, figure out, you know, how much you're going to give this guy. And then on top of that, do the X and O's and do the scheduling and, and you know, making sure everybody's straight. And, you know, I, it's, it's like, gosh, you know what I mean? I guess you need a hell of a coaching staff to help you with everything, huh? Yeah. Yeah, no doubt. And that's where we're really blessed, um, you know, with the people we have working with our guys. So good deal, man. All right. Russ asks, coach, my kids are the biggest Zach Daniels fans. My kids want to go there because of him. And uh, Russ is in Jersey. He plays with so much energy. Please let him know he has a lot of influence on a lot of black youth uh, players. Lots of kids follow him. He is a good role model and inspiring kids to reach the next level. That that's phenomenal. You know, I, it worked out fortunately enough. The Astros have that short porch in left field. And uh, one of my good friends is scouting director for the Astros and he happened to be the one. So he gave me the heads up and I literally got my car keys and I got ready. As soon as Zach got drafted, you know, we're in quarantine. I drove mm -hmm. over to his apartment complex and uh, you know, we, we, hug. I guess you weren't supposed to be hugging or getting close to people then, but I didn't care. He's, He's really become a man uh, on and off the field, and he's gone from, man, this guy's a good athlete or the, the raw label. I would hate the raw label if I was a player to uh -huh. now. He, he is a true baseball player and prospect, and I'm going to relay that message because he's earned all those words right there. Oh, man, I, I love what you just said about that. Uh, I mean, and shout out to Russ with that statement, man. I'm, I'm sure, uh, you know, if he ever sees this and reads that, he's going to be proud of himself. So um, sounds like a good character, good kid, man. Um, and I'm glad I don't mean to cut you off, but I'm glad to hear because I'm from St. Louis and, and there, you know, SLU is there, but you didn't go to college baseball games. And I, I think with how expensive MLB games are now, um, parents are crazy to not bring their kids to college baseball games. Any, you know, just the low, closest team possible. You can get right up close to these guys. Mm. And you can see how they go about their business and uh, maybe mm. see some stuff you don't like, but I guarantee you, you see a lot of things you do like because these guys are, they're all good kids. They're college students, you know, and they're they are working their butts off. So mm. uh, it's a lot easier to relate to our guys than it is to go see Chipper Jones playing Atlanta, you know, mm. my take. No, nah, I mean, hey, you, you I've, uh, again, it's, uh, I'm sure a big time. I, I've never been to 
Mississippi State. I've heard great things. I've never been to LSU. I heard the, their atmosphere. I've mean, I heard, you know, your your campus and and you know stadium and everything is. We were just in Knoxville too, and I I promise you, I I, I didn't even put two and two together. Um, I should have. You know, I, I did want to ride out there with my daughter. My daughter plays tennis. And she, we were just in Knoxville two, three weekends ago and uh, with a tennis tournament out there. And we yeah. were going to ride over to the, you know, we like to go look at the tennis, you know, facilities at these. Sure. Uh, right. So we, we met the Tennessee coach uh, a few years ago, but I didn't even put two and two together. I don't even know if you were there um, maybe about three weekends ago. And I should have reached out and, you know, at least stuck my head and at least peek through the fence to see the, see the, you know, the, 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 the field, man. I didn't. You know, I, didn't, I, haven't made, I haven't made my way out there yet. So bring it but, on, uh, bring it on. We yeah, uh, yeah. need some good improvements. There's more to come. We have a major construction project that we just rolled out some pictures for. A uh, coach mm -hmm. Fulmer is a big baseball fan, and actually, if you listen to Coach Fulmer, our athletic director, he'll tell you he was a great catcher. Um, <laughs> I don't have any video proof of that, but it, it makes him a baseball fan, so that's what I like. No doubt, man. Uh, yeah. I forgot he's AD over there. I, I just remember him being a hell of a football coach, you know? So, but, uh, all right, let me get some of these other questions coming in. Um, all right. Uh, Russ says, do you have any walk-ons or, or JV program? Yeah, you know, the roster right now at our place and a lot of it are out of whack because that, ros that, that draft was only five rounds. We lost 35 rounds of players being drafted. For us, that probably means – with last year's group, seven or eight extra guys. Wow. So normally for us, you can keep 35 guys active on a roster. I was a walk-on. I got a special place in my heart for him. So I hate saying no or turning some guys away. We've done it. Um, you know, even people that are tied into Coach Fulmer or some other people. But, you know, 40 is kind of an ideal number for me. If you don't have any injuries, you may end up with some guys that are not on the active roster. Um but you typically don't have a, a JV team. You've got your group in the fall, you scrimmage, you hope everyone stays healthy. And if the draft didn't crush you, you know, you, you have a, a full roster of 35 guys. Uh, and, and so when you have walk on tryouts, you probably want to make sure if you're taking anyone from there, you you think they're better than probably a couple of your players. Mm. Cause we, we can only have 27 guys on scholarship. So 35 minus 27, being a walk-on, like I said, I was a true, hey, walk-on, go get me some Gatorade. There's <laughs> guys here. We got a kid here who could be a first-rounder, and he's not on baseball scholarship. So uh, our closer used to be a walk-on. So it, that that is – for us to beat Florida, our walk-ons have to be just as good as theirs. So walk-on in our sport is kind of different. So the, the – the one day, hey, you can come out and show us what you can do. That's a very difficult mountain to climb for a kid there. How, so, like, okay, a potential first rounder becomes a, you know, it is a walk on at your school. How does that work? Is it just something that he just loves UT? You just don't have no room for him, and and you just basically listen, man. You're obviously your first round talent. Yeah. You're going to be like, come on. How does that work? How does that happen? You've seen it in our sport. You see these guys uh, like Kyle Freeland. For a long story short. There was, there was only two or three schools really recruiting Freeland. He was skinny, wasn't throwing that hard. And our sport lends itself to um, guys making big adjustments. I mean, Max Scherzer wasn't that heavily recruited. You know, it was basically one power five school that, that really offered him. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, our guy is one of those guys that he could play, but he was skinny and weak. And as he got stronger and he works his butt off like crazy – now all of a sudden he's in those conversations and, you know, same thing. We had a kid here who's a local kid who you can't measure what he's got inside his chest when he's out mm. on the mound. Mm. So even though he's still not lighting up the radar gun and he won't, um, he's just as good as anyone we got at getting guys out. So mm. uh, no discredit to basketball or football, but I always kind of say, you know, if you can shoot, you can kind of shoot, you know, your fastball could do a lot of different things. You may not be able to hit Kyle's, if you're 300 pounds, you can move your feet. You can probably block somebody your whole life. You know, <laughs> our game has so many variables. So that's mm. what I was getting at before with our program, just trying to get better. I think as each player, it's cool. They have rankings now and, you know, you get attention from schools. But I would, if I had a son, 
I would say get better and don't worry about anything else. Just get better because this sport, you know, especially when you get into pro ball, it is cutthroat. The first day comes where they don't see improvement. Looking for another, you know, piece of meat is kind of a harsh way to say it, but it can kind of feel that way. Mm. Uh, I love what you said, man. And uh, I, I'm going to ask this because I want to get these questions in. They're coming in a few. Um, let me just get a comment in. D. Brooks put it out a while ago, but uh, Coach, having, and D. Brooks is in uh, uh, outside of Birmingham, Alabama area. Uh, Coach, I've been watching your program for several years now. Glad to see the diversity on your roster. Um, and uh, let me get this question in here. All right, all right. The Landry says, what what age do you suggest that a kid should attend a Tennessee prospect camp? Right, I, I think starting eighth grade is kind of, it's kind of opened up now to where you would typically do, you know, freshman through ju junior year um, would be the target years. But I think eighth grade is a fair start now. Now we've got great little kids camps, but I, I think, you know, eighth grade through junior year is appropriate. But if you're a really late bloomer that came on strong and you're, uh, you know, a 21 this year, a senior, then yeah, then go show what you can do. Uh, on the opposite end of that, if like I was such a late bloomer as a freshman, I would have looked like a sixth grader on this field. So there's not really a point that might be time to go to a lower level school and NAI school, which, which is where I started out at. Um, and so if you're going to showcase yourself, I think you want to self-assess a little bit where you're at. So, yeah, you might be a Tennessee guy, but as a eighth grader or a freshman, you might not be ready for that. And so you work your butt off so that, man, when I'm a sophomore, I'm going to go show my favorite school, Tennessee or whatever university it is, what I can do. It, all right. So if I'm in eighth, I'm an eighth grader like him. Right. And, and Tennessee's my dream school. Um, and and you're my dad. Well, how would you go about? Would you just go have me go to that camp? And how would you get me assessed or some type of an evaluation, some type of opinion um, before I, I drive or fly out to your camp? How right. would that work? Well, yeah, I, I think it would be choosing the year a little bit by maybe a, an assessment from what someone else thinks. Um, I, I don't have kids myself, but I've I've learned quickly that it doesn't. And my parents were like this. Every kid is perfect to their parents. So it helps to have a little third party deal in there. Same thing with recruiting. If we're recruiting a kid, I'm going to tell them, you know, here's where the program's going to go. You, gotta, you know, we'll work with you. But you better go ask somebody else too, because I might just be selling you a bill of goods. So mm -hmm. on, the, on the player's perspective, it might be good for him and his mom and dad to go ask somebody their opinion and not be combative or get sensitive, but, you know, take it for this guy's probably not that far off if he's a baseball guy. So we're not quite ready for that deal. Or man, I just talked to a parent today. He's like, my kid is, so confident right now because someone told him that he could be a guy. And if someone opens up your eyes and it's like, then show me the way to the next two or three power five schools and I'll show them what I can do. So, no. but mm. I, I would say this for, for, and hopefully I don't have a hundred kids running up, shaking my hand 15 times. But if you go to a camp, you got to find a way to separate yourself, whether it's mm. introducing yourself to one coach, ask a player a question, uh, be the guy that is on the bucket when no one's on the bucket, you know, any, any little way and, and, you know, not in a corny or, or false hustle way, but just find a niche where, you know, at least they know you're the guy, you know, maybe wear a shirt that they're definitely going to know, uh, you know, who you are. As long as there's no cuss words on it or anything. <laughs> like that. <laughs> hey, um, I love it, man. Um, I, I forgot who was on the other day and, um, big D1 coach, and he he was just talking about how he recruited and liked the kid because he picked up the trash. When he when he didn't walk by like every other kid, but he stood back there and picked up the trash and all of that. And so in his mind, he felt like he was a team player. You know right. what I'm saying? Because he didn't have to do that. But, you know, you guys – and that, that was a great nugget you just, you just gave to your parents out there, man. And, you know, it's something that – some you know it's the littlest thing sometimes especially when you are at, at a program like yours where you're getting some very good talented players and it's like everybody's here so what are you going to do with that separate yourself man i love it man that was great great information right there so all right we got uh go ahead i'm sorry 
Alaric's a kid we had last year that he was so good when he was in Texas as a younger kid, people kind of bowed down to him. But when he got here, he's just a, a who's the new guy. And so he couldn't say, look at my ring or look at what I've done. He had to learn, you know, stuff like picking up trash or being a good teammate is how you earn people's respect, regardless of how you perform. And then if you perform, it's like, whoa, this guy's a good teammate or a good dude and a good player. Mm. Um, and, and yeah, I mean, that's how you kind of end up getting yourself either wanted more by pro scouts in that situation or for high school kids by college coaches. All right. Love it. Uh, Oscar says, besides on campus camps, which showcases do your staff attend to evaluate prospects? I, I think Prep Baseball Report does a phenomenal job. They're just in about every state now. Um, they're relatively inexpensive, and the videos are very accessible to us with our password. Um, and, and the scouting reports are usually kind of, um, you know, actual and factual instead of dreaming on stuff or what do we write down here to, to get these people to come back and give us some more money? Um, mm. So I, I'm just a fan of those. Um, I've, I'm kind of gotten tied into those guys. So there's a little bit of loyalty there. But on the front end, I got tied into them for the reasons that I'm talking about right now, you know. All right. Good information there, Prep Baseball. Um, uh, uh, let me see here. Golden Nugget, a press finder way to stand out. All right. All right. Um, I have one more. I had a question here, Coach. I'm sorry. You good. I'm on multiple pages over here, man. So I'm trying to get say hello to everybody coming in and getting these questions. Uh, Bob in Alabama says, is D1 debt period getting extended past August 31st? Yes. Uh, as of now, it's to September 31st. And uh, there's rumor of them extending it multiple months, which probably means kicking the can down the road to – um, you know, next January or something like that. So I had several summer coaches for whatever reason, reach out to me. They were optimistic about October. Um, but I just don't see how an increase in, in cases, which we're going to have, whether people get sick or not, I don't know. And I hope they don't, but you're going to have more positives, uh, on our campus and at high schools. So I, I just don't see how that doesn't get probably pushed into let's just hold off till next year. Cause another thing is, they don't want to spend in money either. And when I say they, I'm not just talking about Tennessee. Um, you know, everyone's dealing with a financial crunch. So why let people not only risk their health, but run out and about and spend money that we don't have. Amen. All right. So, um, so potentially no camps. Um, I know you guys are probably far as recruiting class down right now. We are at the 20 still filling 22s, 23s. Where are you guys at right now? Finishing 22s, right in the thick of 23s and starting 24s. That's kind of a, a vague, you know, umbrella, but that's kind of what it is. So, you know, there are 24s, but kind of right in the middle of 23s. And so it's kind of a reality check for people that that's typically how it works. But if you're on a mission to be at a certain place and stay on that mission, because recruiting changes every day and a kid could get in trouble at his high school or not test well. Um, or, you know, sign in the draft, or you may go watch a kid and it's like, man, this guy can hit like we thought he could, but I don't think he's a shortstop anymore. He's six, you know, um, I, I want to make sure I don't create, you know, a violation by saying somebody's name, but there's right. one guy we had committed as a shortstop and now he's built bigger than our guy Tatis. So he's wow. probably not a shortstop anymore. Right. Uh, so things change every day. I, I think, you were probably taught when you were playing all the time, con control what you can control. You don't have control over that umpire. So unfortunately in recruiting and scouting a lot is, you know, you don't have any control over whether a scout likes you or not. They're human beings sitting back there mm. and they're going to make mistakes. And, you know, they may be also the guy that bets on you and, you know, works out. All right. Great information. Uh, let me see here. We have, Brian asks, what age should a future recruit email you to get on your radar and be identified? I think freshman year on average is good. I mean, if you're a guy that's good enough to get attention as an eighth grader from any school, you're probably a big time outlier. Uh, I think on average, this process does still kind of revolve around juniors typically making. The problem is Twitter and you know, it's like the news. If you watch the news for 30 minutes, you think the world's going to end. But mm. that's 
all the bad crap wrapped into 30 minutes for the most part. And uh, hopefully with at least one good story sprinkled in, but you see all these kids on Twitter uh, committed to Arkansas or wherever I got to commit somewhere. Well, the high percentage of kids still don't know where they're going to school. If you include junior college division two, and it, junior and senior year is still kind of the time for it to go unless you're a big time outlier. So, mm. you know, I think being proactive as a freshman is key, uh, but understanding, you know, the old cliche, it's a marathon, not a sprint, unless you happen to be, you know, Lindor or Baez or somebody like that. And, and, and can you please, I, I, I love, I will love for you to um, explain what an outlier, you know, meaning, you know, what do you, consider an eighth a ninth grade just stud uh you know like what's your definition of that because everybody's definition is different especially right. parents that, like you said a bias towards a kid well let, let me do this one is okay if if you go to a sec camp and you're not the best player at that camp on that day because it's saturday and they're probably going to have one on a sunday too it you know it, you're not you're not that outlier now, we've had several camps because we use them for recruiting as well, where it's like we like two freshmen and we definitely like this junior and we offered this senior, uh, you know, after he left and things like that. But for the most part, if you're not, you know, clear cut in the top four or five, you know, you're probably not even in the recruiting conversations. And if you're not the best, then you're not going to go home and get a scholarship offer just because you went to that camp. Mm -hmm. uh, so but. No, it, it doesn't matter if, if you're if you're having a, a freshman to senior uh, uh, camp. Right. You mean, you know, just high, you know, prospect camp. Right. Because I'm sure, you know, you're not identifying, you know, you're not saying this is just for, you know, 2024. So this is just for, you know, whatever you're you're leaving it open, if I'm not mistaken. Right. So meaning you have to be eighth and ninth grade a stud better than the juniors and seniors that are there. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You know, the skill set's got to be more attractive to the coaching staff at that age. So um, it, it, it's comp incredibly competitive all summer long with all the events and games we go see. So just because you had a good day in a camp, you know, or you run a seven flat 60 and no one else ran that fast that day, you know, that doesn't necessarily put you in that, extreme category and the market will tell you what's going on i mean i don't like saying this because it's recruiting it's not the market but a stock if it's a stock it goes from 75 to, to 80 that's because the value's gone up in the stock market so if you know you're getting talked to by florida state clemson tennessee georgia you are an outlier if you know you're going to the camp and you think you hit good and mom and dad think you hit good but no one's talking to you then you right now your value is it's low you don't have a place that's attracted to you so what do you got to do you got to get to work mm. uh, and and part of getting to work and and having a realistic view of that is being honest with yourself so hopefully you know the market kind of tells you and um First of all, the market should have told me to charge my computer better. So I'm going to do that so I don't lose y'all. I want to be super careful with that. But, right. <laughs> you know. Um, that, hey, yeah, I, I love what you say. Right, bottom line, charge your thing up and I'll be here. But listen, that, I am I'm, I'm, I wrote it down, what you yeah. just said. The market tells you. And sometimes I, I, I told a, I told a, uh, a young kid this. Uh, he, he was He's going into a freshman year. And I said, listen, there, there was an offer on the table. It wasn't an SEC school or anything like that, but it was a D1 offer on the table. And, I, you know, I, I don't obviously it's not I don't think it's what he thought it, it, what he, he wants to take right now. And I, and I get it. it Maybe a little scary to him. But I was like, listen, from a recruiting standpoint, trust me, if you walk into high school with a D1 offer on the table, your stock rises automatically. You know what I'm saying? It's not, I'm not saying he's, you know, you have to be old world, but this is, you know, decent mid-major D1, right? And and I was trying to tell him that, you know what I mean? Like, you know, I'm not saying to, you know, I, I didn't say take it or anything like that, but I was like, let people know that this is what's on the table for you. You know what I'm saying? And and I'm like, people, you know, will open your eyes to that. And, you know, I, they didn't, you know, they I, get it. I'm glad you, you basically said communicate, you know, and one thing, if this were to turn into a recruiting conversation at all, the one thing I wish for more than every baseball person in the world is recruiting became less of a poker game. 
it, it works out so much better for both sides when there's not this posturing. Now, obviously, mm. we got to kind of – we're juggling. We got a list of names on the board and all that stuff. But a lot of parents and, and players, I think – think they got to play poker and I don't want to let them know what else is going on or what I'm thinking or what I'm looking for. Um, I'll tell you, I've coached some of the better matches or kids that were a great match for the program I was at when it was just kind of cut and dry straightforward. This is what we're looking for. And you may save time too. Like, Hey, my family financially, uh, we qualify for a Pell grant. We got to have everything else covered. Otherwise we, we just don't have the money to pay for school. Okay. Well, we're, we're out. We, you know, that's not the category we're in. And I'm just trying to provide you with one example that relates to that. But you know, hopefully the stock market thing just off the cuff helps. As long as you also know, there are stocks out there that are overvalued. <laughs> and then, you know, hopefully in some good cases, there are also some that are undervalued where people just don't recognize, you know, what this guy's about to become, you know, whether it's a Piazza or, or whoever else is a good story. Zach Daniels on our campus. Yeah, they uh, I, I love that stock tip. I mean, stop. <laughs> I like that stock. I had real stock tips. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I like that what you just said. Uh, you know, I didn't mean to, you know, but uh, all right, let me get some of these things in here. Uh, we had Henry says, Oh, I'm sorry, I, I had that question up forever and I didn't even get it. I ain't, I've been talking and didn't realize we did well, not. I think the one question prior to was about, you know, yeah. with this pandemic thing. It, this year, it's a little too late for some kids to make a move, but you just got to be careful in this sport how many repetitions you get. So for me, uh, I redshirted uh, at an NAIA school. I was too small, put on 30 pounds. I want to go play at a big school. I, I always played against the best guys. Well, if I go walk on at Indiana, which is where my dad sent a lot of uh, his former players, and I don't play because I'm – I'm a walk-on Division One guy. I didn't even play the year before. I just went two whole years in a row without playing. That's mm. dangerous, especially for a hit or not getting at bats. Mm. So, pandemic, you're going to see some guys miss their spring season, and then maybe didn't play this summer, and then maybe going to redshirt. Uh, somewhere in there, they got to envision some reps. Otherwise, their their growth is going to get stunted tremendously. So, it's always case by case with this post grad thing. Um, we didn't run anybody off. We had natural attrition this year with a couple guys that just saw, well, if this guy didn't get drafted, then I'm probably not going to play or a couple guys that just realized they're not going to, to play anyway. But, um, yeah, I kind of took pride in the fact that we didn't use this thing as, as a way to run a bunch of guys off. And, um, it, it's a pretty stocked roster. The problem is college baseball everywhere is going to be stocked this year. So it'll be interesting. I, I definitely. I mean, I, I like I said, I think it's the best, best for you guys. You know what I'm saying? You you got a bunch of kids coming back. You got an influx of new, you know, new blood coming in there, and and this is a survival of the fittest for those players, man. But like you said, a lot of players are going to be, you know, disappointed. And I mean, I guess it's just the nature, man. Blame it on the COVID, but uh, it is what it is. Uh, you know, it's a lot of turnover. Henry says. Uh, the honesty is on point. How long would you like a video to be if a player's a player wants to send you one? Um, I tell my players, don't make it too long. You, uh, you don't want to keep you want to keep the coach interest level. Um, is the video too long? Coaches might get bored. Yeah, there's no question. And it's you won't get bored. You're going to scroll past it or, or you'll finish it. So to me, a hitter, an ideal video would be uh, let's say you're at third base three or four ground balls in front, three or four ground balls behind so you can see the ball carry uh, running down the line, maybe in a game or at least at a real full sprint, and then a few swings up from the side for sure and three or four swings from behind so you can see the flight of the ball just as you did on your throwing, and that's it. Pitcher, you know, five or six from the side, five or six from, you, you know, behind either the catcher or behind the pitcher, again, so you can see flight of the ball. And that doesn't, you know, even if you got a knuckleball and 17 other pitches, you might as well keep it at about 10 to 12 because that's all that's most likely going to get watched. And, you know, again, I keep covering my butt. There's always exceptions to this, but you want to – it's a game of averages, so you might as well treat things as, as uh, average. And um, I, I came up with this phrase on accident today. 
people that are sending an email to coaches for the first time, you're not trying to get the coach's interest. You're trying to get them to read it, you mm. know, and mm. if they read it, they'll decide whether they're interested or not. But mm. some people, hopefully that makes sense. Cause it may sound. Uh, no, I was going to ask you, please. Yeah. Get, get, into that. How do I get this thing read? And that's what, you know, Henry's talking about is you want the video to be seen if they like it or not, that's up to them, but you can't have it be sent and not be seen. You made no progress. So how, how do you get this thing? Read? You got to have something popping or something that, no, I think more just to the point, it, you know, the video early and you know, Hey, I, my dad was a high school coach. We don't talk to coaches enough, but there's only so much time in the day so to have all these references and this article, how you won the subdivision state title, you know, whatever, that's great. But you got to imagine how many kids, you know, all of us are looking at, doesn't matter where you coach at. So you're not trying to get me all fired up about you. And I shouldn't say me, just any coach. You just want it to be seen. And then from there, if you get something back, now you can say, here's how I'm going to get you to like me. I, mm. I got this, this, and this, or call this coach. He, he believes in me, so on and so forth. Oh, I love it. Bye. Oh, parents. <laughs> it's tough. It's tough. My, Randy Maisie, who's a great, I mean, one of the best baseball minds in the country. He's a head coach at West Virginia. Uh, he used to, now I know he was doing it to make extra stock money, thinking of stocks, but he used uh -huh. to do parent seminars and basically coach little league parents on how to handle a lot of stuff, including behavior at the park. And it it's, it's different. If it's not what you do, then you don't know. It's like if I had my sink was clogged, I, I wouldn't know how to act or what to do. And, um, you know, because I'm not an expert at it. And and, I, and that's my my thing. I And I'll post my master class and I and listen, they get a lot of great information here and they may feel like I don't need it and it's not important to me. And or, or I could just keep watching what Coach D does, I, which is cool with me either way. But but I just feel like. I, I've been I've been going through it the last two or three years and with my own players, right? And I see I see the mistakes that I've made as being a coach and running a program and what parents make. Yeah. And, um and sometimes one small mi mix up or one small overlook or I, you know, you you put money in because you it, it it like you just said, you don't know. You can go a windfall of just spending money or whatever, but you have to be precise on what you really want to do because you may spend a lot of money on stuff that really doesn't matter to see to get in front of a University of Tennessee coach or or something like that. And one mistake can cost can cost your child getting an opportunity to play in college. And I've, I've seen it. I'm, I'm 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 and kids are like their feelings get hurt extremely. You know, they get their their feelings get hurt fast if they don't think that they should are getting the love that they think they should. And it's, and ultimately it comes down to a multiple, you know, a lot of things here and there, but I just feel like, man, from, from, again, from personal mistakes I've made to, you know, reading the messages behind the scenes on parents. And, and I love the information, but sometimes I feel like they're just, you know, they're like, I, I, everything is all right. If I'm a 2021 parent, get it. I, I, I get it. I, I'm gonna be patient and, and cool, but, you know, this is something that's never been done. Never, never. Nobody's going through a COVID thing. You know, you just say your roster is crazy full. And I know you, your 2021 class is probably built out three years ago, two or three years ago. But, you know, a lot of these, you know, I, I would I would be like, yo, what, what's going on? <laughs> like, what am I going to do? What is my so how do, what's your advice to a 2021 parent that doesn't have an offer as we sit here right now? What, what would be your best advice to him? Or her? Uh, I think you kind of led me into this answer for any parent and family based off your situation is all the pro ball you played, I bet there were some teammates that you didn't really like the way they played. But if you were guys going to go get dinner afterwards, you were cool with hanging out with that guy. You had business and you had personal. And mm. I think the recruiting thing can kind of turn into that too. Like don't get angry with your coach because you're not getting all kinds of crazy offers or upset with your kid. And if it, your kid gets a double, don't go talk a coach's ear off for 30 minutes. Did you see that? And he's great. And you know, it, it's, Hey, some of the best business guys out there are cold blooded, as you know. And I really think this recruiting thing in baseball, unfortunately, is kind of you got to put on your business hat. Mm. And, you, know, you may have a personal relationship with a coach. You appreciate them and your son you love. But how, how do you just kind of remove the emotion and be a little more I don't, cold blooded? It's kind of harsh for something like this, but just 
a little more diplomatic about how are we going to find the solution of where this, you know, player is going to end up. And sometimes that requires patience, but it definitely requires kind of that diligent thought out process as opposed to letting your emotions or feelings cloud everything. And so I think that applies to everybody. Put that on steroids for 2021. Mm. I mean, you just got to sit back and almost kind of laugh at how comical it, or it's not comical for a lot of people, but how what desperate times we're in. And, hey, there's so much more serious things going on with this virus. You're talking about struggling to find a college, it'll be fine. You know, I went to three different schools during my career, mm. and I wouldn't, I wouldn't trade it for anything in the world. Mm. I've got a lot of great people in my life, and all those different experiences formed me. So it's not a life or death decision. And then also it's you know, a deal where a 21 might go to a JUCO, even though he's a three, eight student, just so he can play and let this thing calm down. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, but I think y- you do have to calm down and remove emotion from the whole deal and just think about it diplomatically so that you can hopefully make a, a rash decision or a rational decision, not a rash decision. You know, I love it, man. Appreciate it. Great information. All right. Um, questions coming in. Uh, if your son is a late bloomer physically, but starting to grow into his frame as a rising junior, is major college D1 unlikely given a lack of showcases in camps? No, I don't I don't think so. I, I think what you run into, like you said, our 21 class was built out, but then all of a sudden a kid starts throwing 97, 98, even 99, and it's like, wait a minute. <laughs> I'm not – I hope he comes, but I'm not going to put all my eggs in one basket. You, mm. you might start looking. So – I don't think it's too late for that at all. Um, you know, we mentioned the prep baseball report uh, deal. They had the futures games lately, and that's for rising juniors. That's typically the most attended event for college coaches only in the summer. So, again, I, I don't think that's too late. And I even think seniors, um, it, it's not too late. It just may be a deal where it, you got you got as good as anybody in the country but your favorite school doesn't want you because they don't feel like they need you Mm -hmm. or, you know, your favorite school likes you and now they feel like you've gotten good enough, but maybe they don't have as much money as they would have had two years ago. If you would have been in that first group starting out, um, or it might be a deal where it's going to be a even more competitive roster because you're a center fielder. And so is a guy they already had committed, but you know, you, you just give it a little bit of uh, – you educate yourself on the place and the decision a little bit or however you want to term all that stuff we were just talking about. And then you go with your gut and you don't look back. And if for some reason it's it it was the wrong thing, it, it'll work out, um, you know. I love it. All right. Um, <laughs> my boy D. Brooks, man, I love this dude. Tell <laughs> <laughs> well, him to buy season tickets. <laughs> Stand in the stadium. <laughs> all right, all right. Uh, B- Bubba says, "What do you look for in a shortstop?" Oh man, Lindor and Baez is who we were talking about earlier. So those guys <laughs> for a shortstop, I, I think um, it's funny. We go to that poker thing. A lot of coaches try and act like they don't want a lot of shortstops because you know they want you know they don't want to offend one that they think can play there. And then for a lot of high school kids, I'm the shortstop. I want to play there. Well. You got to realize if you put yourself in a certain category, if you're sitting down uh, with the head coach at UCLA, it doesn't matter if he tells you you're a shortstop or not. You're going to UCLA. You're going to have to beat out some really good players to play, and that's kind of what I wanted to turn our roster into. I don't, I don't know that we'll ever have the best one on paper, but it should be really hard to wear this thing. There's, mm. there's as many fans. Uh, I mean, our the size of our stadium for our sports across the country. So do you think they want it easy for a guy to wear a balls jersey on the mm. baseball field? Mm. So they're going to have to compete. Mm. Uh, so that ties into the shortstop thing a little bit is understand just because you are one doesn't mean you'll stay there. Mm. And then also know that all college coaches are looking for athletes. There's normally great athletes at shortstop. But in order to stay there, my dad always said that six hole play is the separator can you go into the six hole and throw out a good runner like a leadoff hitter and make that throw? If not, you may have really sweet actions and hands, but you might have to be a second baseman. If you can make that throw, you know, you're, you're kind of in the mix. But for our league, we're, we always talk about Chris Burke. You're looking for the Chris Burke, Bregman, uh, India, the guy who's your 
three or four hole hitter and he's your shortstop, that's a that's a pretty special dude. Um, but yeah. that's kind of what comes out of our league. I, I, I and that's all I was about to say. Like you laughed when you said Lindor or uh, Baez and all of that, but in in the in the grand scheme of things, those those guys, yes, they eventually get drafted the first round. But when they they're signing with schools, they're signing with schools like Tennessee. You know what I'm saying? So. Uh, again, obviously, these guys are superstars in the major leagues, but I'm just, you know, uh, sometimes I think, you know, uh, you know, it's, Tennessee is sexy and all of that. But I think sometimes you have to really see, you know, saying certain players to be like, OK, yeah, all right. You know, he's 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 different. You know what I'm saying? He's he's right. that that dude. And, and, you know, there's a lot of other guys that, I you know, you may think can't play and all of that. But most big time SEC Show us, us, I believe, you know what I'm saying, will be drafted and drafted fairly high in, in the big league soon, you know? Yeah, and one, one thing you want there, too, is coaches will probably joke. They'll take two or three headaches on their roster. Um, mm-hmm. I say that teasingly, but it's true. But shortstop or catcher, you want a point guard out there, you know? So, you know, there's many things. Basically, what I was kind of alluding to is you're looking for a superstar athlete at our level at, at any college to play short, but – you also want to have a little bit of point guard to you at that position. You, you can get away with it, not having it at other positions, but that one's key. All right. Um, shout out to my boy, Tony. Uh, we got Alan says, what type of technology is used for hitters at UT? Sensitive topic, Alan. We've spent more money than you could ever. <laughs> Coach Pruitt better get those guys in all kinds of bowl games over there with football, which I believe they will, but, We've spent a ton of money. Um, what we try and do is accumulate all that, that data and decide what we want to put in front of our guys. Um, the Rap Soto is one. The biggest one for us is synergy is just video. It's not necessarily, you, you know, exit velo or stuff like that. But for guys to see visually their swings uh, and get instant feedback. So many of these kids now are visual learners. And so to be able to see that stuff is key. And I love our video room is right behind our dugout, which is right next to our locker room. Mm-hmm. So it's in a key spot. Um, the Edutronic camera is something really expensive that everyone shows off in recruiting now that's had the good fortune of buying it. Uh, w- there's so much down there. But I think the big key one now for us is video. And when you have bats and or synergy, you can pull up. You know, maybe a kid feels like he's striking out too much like I used to. You can pull up all your two strike pitches like that and then just watch them on roll here and see, man, I'm always out front or I'm always pulling my head or whatever it might be. Mm. So it's, it's, it's like anything, you know, some, somewhere in there, you asked me a question and I I cheated. I I said, it's both, you know, somewhere you got to meet in the middle and technology's become so key. Uh, But it is a game that, you, you know, Rod Carew, Honus Wagner, you know, guys that just got dirty, pulled their pants up, gritted their teeth and competed were really good at. There's a, still a lot of value in that. There's just more information now that, you know, you probably don't want to turn your back on. Mm, I love it. I uh, That's my biggest thing, man. Right now I'm with the Pirates right now and just to, just to feel the how behind I am. I got a 27-year-old kid and I, when I tell you, <laughs> I got him on speed dial and, <laughs> and just, just from the technology side of things. And he's it, it just from he's like, coach, anything you need, yo, you know, whatever. And I'm like, I'm just blowing him up because he is like I, I he knows the technology. You know what I'm saying? I, I you know, I he's he's showing me baseball cards of mine when he was 10, 11, 12 years old. <laughs> he, he gets a kick out of that. Right. But I'm blowing him up. You know what I'm saying? Because he knows the technology stuff. You know what I'm saying? And it's it's, it's like, yo, and, and for some guys out there that eventually aren't good enough to either make it here or play where I played junior college, there's going to be a great need coming up, or there already is for guys that are baseball players, but also can do the nerdy things. And, you know, I'm not saying that in a negative way and, and have a good mix because you've seen it. We've got some combating going on of old school versus new school. And I've, like I said, I cheated before. Why not a little bit of both? Hey. hey. Amen to that. And it was kind of heard and I seen it, but you know, I really saw it in spring training this year where I was like, these guys might have might have touched a you know a blade of grass on college, might have, but they know drive line. 
they know ins and out of rap soda you know what i'm saying they've been through their program and all of that and even the guy big boy i can't remember his name but he came from the driveline program and he just said yo d he's like anybody that you know wants to get a job and he it's his first year he's teaching he's telling me you know what i should tell other people that want to get in the pro game he was like yo this is how i got in the pro game so anybody that wants to get in the pro game um Tell them to go to these drive lines programs and, you know, essentially work for them for a couple of years, learn the systems and all of that. Because he said the, ma the major league team, he said he had a bidding war of, of, of teams wanting him to work for them because he knew that 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 technology stuff. You know what I'm saying? And I was like, that's great information. He was like, yeah, he's like, that would be my, you know, and I ain't asked for it. He just we just talking. He's a big boy. You know, you could tell he probably never played baseball. And if he did, it was like an eighth grade. Right. But, you know, but he, he got hired by the Pirates because he knew that stuff. So. Sure. Um, anyway, uh, Michael says, any advice for parents in urban communities with sons that want to play D1 ball and have the talent but lack exposure opportunities? It's, it's tough. I, I'll say this for, for all people, um, regardless of, of what settings, you know, you, you live in or, or you play in, um, the word exposure now has become, uh, it, it's prevalent for everybody. There's never, there's not going to be the guy anymore that I can say I got in my car and drove farther than anybody else because a parent or someone else will just tweet it out and now everybody's seen it. So mm -hmm. the good thing is if you really can play, um, regardless again of your background, you'd like to think someone would see you. There are some exceptions to that, like we've been kind of harping on with everything, but th that's a really tough one. The big thing is, you know, coming from urban communities in particular study your ass off, if I can say locker room talk, because not only do you need to qualify, but for baseball, a lot of the ways we make it work is by combining baseball and academic money. And I, I know we mentioned before, some schools have diversity money. There's more that don't, which makes no sense to me. If, if there were going to be a change out of all this stuff, um, I, I think it's good that there's been some statues of people that they didn't have a good reputation. So why is there a statue? But Zach Daniels, we mentioned him earlier. I don't mean to speak for him, but Zach probably doesn't care that much about those statues. It doesn't affect his day-to-day -day life, especially if he was a high school or grade school player. What could immediately impact these guys' lives is if we can find more scholarship money because it's deserving and open up those opportunities. Um, but we're kind of starting more at ground zero in the urban community. As far as academics, it's got to be crushed. And then as far as baseball, you just have to find a way to get repetitions. And unfortunately for our sport, um, it's become the more you spend, the better environment you're in. You know, you want to play against the Canes or Team Elite or one of these famous teams, you either got to be on them or you got to pay a lot of money to play against them. Mm. Just playing, it may not be great competition, but I think just playing is so important. Our mm. guys always want to know, what league should I go to? What should, just please just play. I don't want to get involved in politics. Just make sure you're playing. Way too many kids these days sit mm. on the couch or they, they hit 10 balls and they say, where's my scholarship? So you just got to find a way to get repetitions regardless of the environments. And, and if it's with some play it again sports, batting gloves or you came to university here or another university and said you guys got any leftover gloves whatever just find some equipment unfortunately our sport's a little more expensive in that deal and then who wants to play where can i go and if it's uh you can afford to go to a great showcase awesome if not just keep playing and if you really want to pass people up you hopefully will uh uh, my boy Mike out in Cali, man. I got that message earlier from you. He just, I hope, I hope you were listening in. I haven't seen you on today. Uh, I hope he just answered your question. I that was a question he had. He's he had a 2023, and he was worried about playing for a big time organization and getting less reps and paying a lot of money. Or, you know, I don't want to. I shouldn't explain his business. It was a private message, but you know what I'm saying. It, it, or rep it out. Rep it out. Yeah, or, or or get get go to a you know not so famous team but play all the time. You know what I'm saying? So I I just messaged him. I said, "What's your gut telling you?" I know what I would do, and he he messaged me back, and I did not look at it. But um, I, it was like I had to get ready to do this. But I'm hoping he's on, and I hope he heard what you just said. The main thing is getting the abs. And if listen, man, I oh, oh man, uh, I I love what you're saying. I, I I'm gonna I gotta see this comment over here, man. Um. Uh, 
you want to look at my nephew Antonio Anderson at shortstop. He is that player you just mentioned. He's out of East Cobb, Georgia, big time program, right? 2024, and he remind you of a a Rod, a Rod, all right? You know what I'm saying, bit So, <laughs> <laughs> hey, <laughs> my my buddy I played with freshman year went and saw. I, I like that. Uh, if I was allowed to legally tweet or uh, like that tweet or, or comment, I would do it. But uh, <laughs> I played with a guy that played against a Rod down there in Miami Westminster. He said that they saw two Mariner scouts come sit on the right side and he grounded out to the shortstop his first at bat. They looked at their stopwatches, high five each other and rolled out. I guess they had to make sure they had the runtime right for how big he was. And right. You know, no doubt first pick of the draft. So. Hey man, this is, that's why, you know, that's why I said, I got to see this kid. Hey, you know, that's hefty lofty praise. And I'm not, you know, I've learned to not be, you know, my first inkling is like, okay, but I've learned not to do that no more. You yeah, know what I'm saying? Never know. Here. I remember I saw a 13 year old uh, uh, Blaze Jordan, and I never saw the kid. You know, I, I didn't know. I don't. I didn't watch YouTube at that time. And kid, you know, all my all my kids on my team. Coach, you don't know who that is. I'm like, no, I don't know who that is. <laughs> and after that, four or five games after that weekend, I was like, yo, <laughs> okay, I need uh, this kid can hit. He really, you know, he showed me what he's all about. You know what I'm saying? So I, I, uh, I. I don't want to tell somebody that I don't know. I don't think that they can play. All right, we've got another one that says, uh, my boy Allen says, uh, I think it's just another dope idea if somebody can make it happen. I would love to see some baseball specific virtual tours of facilities. So we've um, we've actually kind of comboed up with football and are going to do one of ours here real soon. We save a little money doing the combo platter. Um, but we have a flyover tour that's on YouTube. I mean, you can find a crazy amount of stuff on YouTube that you, you maybe um, go down a rabbit hole for a while, but unexpectedly you can see a lot of different things. Uh, and then for us, we've wanted to do just a YouTube one where we have some commentary that goes with it. Mm. And the main reason we want to do that is to show it to coach Serrano who came before us and did a lot of things here and just show how much the facilities changed. Mm. Unfortunately, we always got, a new project that's coming up. So we keep saying, well, let's wait till that's done. So it looks a little better, mm -hmm. um, but we hope to have both those things up soon. And, and part of it's just getting with the times of the pandemic, but also because it would be great for people to see in general. So, yeah, I mean, like, again, these questions are coming in and I, I haven't asked my main ones uh, real fast as far as enrollment, you know, what are the costs that it comes to, you know, going to uh, UT Knox in and out of state um, and uh, how many kids, you know, are at the, at, at the campus, you know? Right. Our, our campus is about 28,000 students. It's your average size state school. That's obviously a bigger size campus. Um, I coached at a private school that was only about 8,000 students. Um, it, you can feel that it's smaller on campus, uh, but it, there's also some ones that size that are really spread out. So, you know, I think you want a compact campus and you want to be able to be in classrooms that are not overly big. You don't want a bunch of 500 uh, seat auditorium classes. And it's one benefit we have here. And I'm just trying to speak in general terms, but our campus is 28,000, but it actually is very compact. And then most of the classes our guys are in are slightly above, you know, high school size classes. So they get what they need as far as attention. And then the other thing is, a small school may be more right for a kid than a bigger school. And then for me, I wanted to be able to go to the basketball and football games and, you know, mm. be at a state school, um, mm. regardless of which you're at, your family is going to be your baseball team. You're going to be mm. around that more than you're around your family. Mm. Your fraternity sorority is probably going to kind of be the student athletes because they're going to be living the similar type lifestyle that you are. Mm. You're not going to be able to, you dang sure aren't bumping into all 25, 28,000 people. Right. You're going to be operating at a bus very busy, high rate schedule that's consolidated to a certain amount of people on a certain part of campus. So um, for, for what that's worth, I, I think size matters, uh, no pun intended, but, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> it's, it's all rel you know, it's relative to what's going on with the parameters of the size of campus and things like that. So. All right, good deal. Coach, I'm I've got a few more questions, man. I, I appreciate the time, man. I uh I don't want to hold you up too much longer, man. Let me get all these in. 
Uh, I want um, we asked this, but I you know he might not have been on. I want to know how many HBCU UT puts on their schedule. He must. He, yeah. he must have been on. In the in the two and a half years, and and you would have counted last year's because the schedule was done. We've had two schools, um, you know, in the last three years, and so what's difficult again is the distance, but also you're you're looking to compensate people fairly, um, and you got to be strategic about how much money you spend where we've we've spent an awful lot of money ensuring that we're at home it's one of the reasons we put turf on our field so but it, it's hard to match up tuesdays and travel and you know things like that so we're all playing for playing anyone that's within a radius of us all right uh let me see a few more here coach and i get you out of here uh Uh, um, Alan says, when do you expect to hold camps? You know, to be honest with you, January is kind of what I, my gut tells me. And our compliance people are really good people here. Um, they don't act like they're, you know, patrolling our university. They act like they're trying to help us. And so they give us a lot of insight. And I think right now they truly don't know what is going to happen. And they've been ahead of the curve on some of the other things. So right now, unless someone else has got better uh, scoop than we do, uh, I think everything's on hold, and and I think January is going to be the earliest something like that happens. All right, um, all right, Coach. I want to, um, if you could, I appreciate it. I think that's pretty much. We're going to close out the questions here. Um, two things. Um, if you could, you know, many may may not have your Twitter handle. What, what's the best way for our kids? um the listeners to uh send you video even though you talked about how you like it which is great information uh i'm uh, uh last question just kind of popped in when are you going to schedule games in the northeast oh man when the temperatures go up <laughs> <laughs> no no here here's what happens the scheduling thing is crazy we have 10 weeks of sec play so we're gonna play four other weekends and then on those weekends we're gonna play three of them at home which is what most SEC schools do. And then we're going to take one, I don't know if you want to call it a fun trip, but one experience trip for our guys. So one year is going to be coming up at the new ballpark in Arlington where the Rangers play. It's going to be a round robin. Those tournaments are sponsored, and we actually get recruited to go play there. One is going to be an MLB-sponsored tournament in Arizona in a couple of years. We went to Round Rock last year. So – the only non-SEC games we're going to leave our campus for, for the most part, are going to be on a Tuesday, and those need to be close enough we can bus there and bus back, and our guys not really miss class at all, almost. So, you know, you play on Tuesdays, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and that's kind of how it works. For us to go up that way would be fun, but it would have to be really during February or the first week of March. And we'd have to come out of pocket and probably pay for that flight unless somebody recruited us with a really good offer to come up there. Mm. So, <laughs> but the video thing, here's my best answer. This is for me and other people. I don't know why I didn't think about this before. No offense to anyone who sent emails before uh, with videos, but send a link. Coaches, maybe we're jerks or maybe we're lazy. We don't want the wheels to be spinning or to have to download it or carry it over. Um, no offense to any of the recruiting websites, but putting in a password. I mean, if you lost a university of whoever the day before, just something asking you for a password may put you off, you know, in a tail. <laughs> so if you can convert it to a link, that's huge where it's one click and go. And it's a short video. For me in particular, email is the way to go. I know the other coaches are more active on social media than I am. Um, I don't know why I'm not. It's just, you know, whatever your beliefs are, stick to them. And I'm not too into that stuff. So, um, you know. What, is, what is your email, Coach? Is it the, the... – it, It's T. Vitello. So, first initial, Vitello, at utk.edu. So University of Tennessee, Knoxville is utk.edu. And it's on the website as well. Oh. All right, T, you said T, T N K U or TK? U-T-K.edu. Oh, okay. U-T-K. So it's on our website under um, the baseball coaches, coaching staff. Oh. And I'll say this too. 
Um, and I'm not, uh, you know, bring on the emails, anybody that's listening, but more times than not, you probably need to figure out who the recruiting coordinator is. Even if you're a pitcher, um, it's probably better to send it to the recruiting coordinator than it is the pitching coach, you know? All right. I'm going to miss that. Say that one more time, coach. I, I know it's a good nugget. I know it was. No, I, I think guys um, are less likely to hear back from anyone other than the, the recruiting coordinator. And, exactly. uh, you know, I know sometimes they just attach all the coaches on it. That can mm -hmm. be dangerous too, because you're thinking, I want everybody to see it. Well, we all might be up in the office like, well, maybe he'll respond. Maybe he'll respond. Right. You know, so there's no, there's no one right answer. Uh, but I think, sending it to the recruiting coordinator or one of the younger coaches on staff that maybe runs camp and then follow up. If you don't hear, you know, mm. I don't think there's anything wrong with sending something a second time or just saying, did you get it? And uh, at the same time, don't get your feelings hurt. Understand that um, coaches have a lot to get to uh, in addition to practice and coaching. Uh, so you may not hear back. It's maybe it wasn't meant to be, I guess, if you're a big karma person. All right. Um, do you have a club program? Have you recruited a – do you have a – all right, last – I keep saying last question, all right, and I'm a prom, uh B. Gibbs, last question. Uh, do you have a club program and have you – do you have a club – let me post, post it up there because I'm reading it fast. Uh, uh, do you yeah. have a club program and have you recruited a player out of it? Okay. Yeah, we, we don't have a local organization that we're tied into. You can, by rule, do that if you're a university. Um I, I think I've actually offended some people with my lack of politics. They think because I'm just trying to watch the game or, you know, um, don't get all up in someone's business uh, while they're trying to coach. You know, we don't like them, but I, I, I'm not a big fan of politics. We like people that want to come to us. We don't want to have to beg people. And mm -hmm. also um, people that give us honest information are people we work with. And ultimately, especially JUCOs, we want people that win. Mm. And uh, mm. that doesn't mean you got to win the whatever trophy, um, but that you're trying to win and there's some values there. I mentioned Jace Tingler. He played for Dave Bingham, who was our pitching coach's mentor. Dave Bingham, um, you know, went to Omaha with KU and his group, the Kansas City Sluggers, you'd watch them play and they looked like they were trying to, you know, everyone else was showcasing. They were trying to rip the opponent's face off, not literally, but – they were out there trying to win. And so you knew what kind of guy you were getting from those organizations. So mm. I, I think mm. honesty and a, and a pursuit of winning is something that helps. And then, you know, at the end of the day, I think you, you went full circle, find a place that's a good match for you. That's going to get you repetitions and get you better. Cause this game is a, it's a big climb. We've all played with that guy that was the best when he was 13 years old, but then he was nothing four years down the road. You, you don't want Say to be no, 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 no. I said this other day with my boy Vic with the other night. I said, and I, if I had the DJ thing, I'd go, Juju -ju, bombs and good, you know, whatever. Please, please, for so these parents that are out here worried about the 13 or 14 year old kid that just got the, the, the scholarship offer, can can you can you please? You and I wish I had other family members of mine on here to listen to and all the sports to listen to this too. But anyway, can you please say that again, coach? Sure. And in basketball, like LeBron and Kobe, you might want to be at your best when you're 18 or 19 for the reasons that you know, because you follow those guys. This sport, if you're getting recruited by any college, I don't care what college it is, you have a chance to get drafted. So by nature, if you're getting recruited, you want to be your best when you're 27, 28, maybe 29 or 30. So imagine how far away from 13 and 14 years old, 27, 28 and 29 is. So if anything, just, you better put on the seatbelt and realize you got to keep going. Otherwise, it's not going to happen. And there's guys like DeGrom and Joe Nathan you mentioned are late bloomers on the mound. But as a hitter, that first year they see you're not hitting, it might get real real uh, narrow for you as far as your, your window of opportunity. Uh, okay. <laughs> um, thank you. Uh, coach, for that statement right there. Uh, Trying to help, hopefully, but also just speaking what I'm, I'm, I'm no expert, but um, not being any good, I had to sit back and kind of watch and learn and, and now know a few things. Listen, I, I think sometimes, like I said, and all, all us parents that are, are, are here right now listening, and 
if you are of any age and you played any sports, you know these guys that uh, coach is talking about. But what happens is because our sons and our you know kids are involved and and in this age group and stuff, you start getting blinded and and you start forgetting those things. So when coach like that reminds you. And because you so, you know, you know, I get it. You sizing up your son against the next guy and you want to know why he's this guy got the offer and this guy, whatever. Just, like you said, just be patient, man. Some guys that are just peaking a little bit earlier and uh, coach has been around the game and knows that that 13, 14 year old kid by the time he's 16, 17, there's nowhere to be found. He says you want to be peaking at 17 and 18 years old. All right. So, yeah, uh, man. go ahead, coach. I'm sorry. There, there's a there's a good book to. I mean, anything I've gotten has been stolen from older coaches or books, but there's a book called Grit, and uh, it's just called Grit. And in there, she starts breaking down parenting, and, you know, it, it's kind of about rewarding uh, or complimenting the approach or effort your kid has as opposed to what awards they're winning and getting. Now, you certainly want to pat them on the back if they win a trophy or something, but um, mm -hmm. applauding the approach is exactly in line with, Coach Saban or Coach Pruitt, what do they all talk about? Approach, approach. John Wooden, approach. Focus on approach and you'll get wins. So why would parenting be different than coaching? Uh, if you're applauding the approach to everything, then you'd like to think the results will take care of themselves. But it's it gets a little toxic when you see some coaches or parents focus on the, the uh, results a little too much. Listen. Um, I, 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 you ain't just saying this for the parents listening in. Listen, there's some family of mine I need to go ahead and share that message to. Lord have mercy. You know, sometimes in certain households, I, you know, I don't know, you know, you ain't, you ain't there yet, coach. You ain't there yet. You will be there soon. Where, I, I follow you. I, right. I, got, I got five nieces and one nephew, and that could, being the uncle is the easiest thing in the world. You just do all the fun stuff, and, and you don't have to worry about the meat and potatoes. Well, when, but, they, when they become your own, <laughs> all right? You know, the other side is going to, they're going to, other side is going to forget that you've been doing this for years, right? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. You don't been involved. It, it's going, you're going, they're going to forget that type of stuff because they're, your, your child and your, it, it's a unique situation. You know what I'm saying? It's unique to this whole big sports thing. I'm just, I'm right. just letting you know, brother. You know what I'm saying? So, uh, anyway, man, I, you, you get my drift, right? So, yeah. um, listen, uh, this is my master class and we talk about things like this. I, I jot down these messages, six week master class. All right, in less than two weeks, I'm uh, launching this thing. So sign up for this thing, man. Um, man, you see the type of guests that's coming on. You see the knowledge that, that is being shared. Um, how dope is this? I got to take it take it to New York and hood with this. Yes, how dope is this information? God, you're getting. Gosh, all right. So, um, Coach, I appreciate your time, man. You almost spent an hour and 40 minutes with us, man. And uh, I know, you know, you got, you got a lot going on with, with, you know, stuff going on in your campus and while and practice and COVID and everything, man. So I appreciate the time you're taking out to do this, man. It means a lot. A lot of people will see this. A lot of people will become more of a fan of yours because, listen, I heard a lot of great things about you. I know I've become more of a fan of yours, you know what I'm saying, listening to you today. Um, more of a fan of the uh, uh, volunteer program. And uh, so, listen, I know for a fact you will make a lot of new fans out here instead of just being the big essay now they kind of see the face to the to the program man and see what this dude is about and i i know for a fact i got a lot of comments in here they all say man i love this dude i like this dude i like what he's spitting uh you know what i'm saying so that's what you want so if you could give us one message to take us on out man i would appreciate it well no i i want to go back to the the motto of control what you can control a lot of people are just trying to gain knowledge which is the first step is smart because knowledge is power um, and then, you know, when you gather that knowledge, realize there's certain things you have control over getting better every day, making good decisions, doing a little research, but, uh, you don't have control over how many people like you or what they're willing to give you for your ability or your son's ability. So that's kind of how it is to me. And, and, um, you know, I appreciate you having me on. I don't want to go without saying that too. And, and also making us look and sound good. I think it's reality, but, but bringing up the diversity thing is tough because it's something we take pride in. I think it's ridiculous and it's not University of Tennessee's fault that we don't have financial backing to support that. Uh, that's a major problem across the country, not just with 11-7, but with diversity scholarships. But um, that's a hard thing to sell without sounding phony or like you're trying to use Zach Daniels to get what you want. So uh, the fact that you bring it up makes it easier for me to talk about. But 
it's a staple of what we want to do. And it, it doesn't matter who ends up being in our uniform. We want them to be of high character. And uh, so far, that's kind of gone in the right direction for us. So we want to keep on keeping on. Amen, man. And listen, man, um, like I said, the whole big picture, man. Um, I've noticed it. I know a lot of, you know, uh, black, white, Spanish, it don't matter, man, is going to listen and, and become a fan. Like I said, uh, it's not many. Listen, they all claim to be. But um, you're doing it, you know, talking it and doing it, you know what I'm saying? It's two different things. So before you even came on the show and talking diversity and all of that, uh, I, I, if I had a kid, I can go on your roster and go and see, you know what I'm saying? Like, OK, I see what he's about. The proof is in the pudding where other coaches talk it and then you look at the roster and there's no one there that looks like what he's talking about. You know what I'm saying? So um, and I say that, you know, to all parents listening in, I don't matter white, black and different, no matter that. But for my me being a black, you know what I'm saying? Uh, and coming up and seeing the dynamic and the landscape of this power five conferences and how they, you know, schools are doing. And man, you, you are a breath of fresh air, man. And, and kudos, man. Like I said, you are, you have made a lot of fans today. You know what I'm saying? No doubt about it uh, on top of what you've been doing already, man. And so um, I will be in contact. You know that um, uh, tell my boy Ross, tell him to get out his feelings, man. You know what I'm saying? Tell him Tell he him to get out his feelings. You know what made him a great player was he was pretty emotional, but we tease him. He's easy to tease because he'll, he'll get a little sensitive every now and then on you. Yeah. So tell him to get out his feelings. You know what I'm saying? And 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 when I call, answer them. Well, now nah, I ain't got to worry about him. I'm coming. I'm going to the top man now. You know what I'm saying? But you I still like Ross. Really? You know what I'm saying? We had great conversations. So, you know, my thing is when I when I call, Tell him don't be dodging my call, man. You know what I'm saying? Tell him we, we ain't got to be on it like that, man. <laughs> we'll just bring you up in the office and roll right by his office without saying anything. So. Please, please. All right, man. I appreciate it, bro. So listen, uh, tomorrow we'll be back on. Um, great information. We've got another coach coming on 4 p.m. tomorrow, Eastern. We're going to keep this knowledge going. All right. Um, coach, again, I thank you, my brother. Thank you so much for coming on, man. You bet. I enjoyed it. All right, coach. I'll see you, man. Big fan, man. Take care, man. You too.